Yeah. All right, so we'll go ahead and call this meeting of the Interstate 35 Board of Directors regular February 27, 2023 meeting to order. Um, I would like to welcome everybody. I'm happy to see all the interest in the meeting tonight. I hope the kids have brought questions. No? Okay. All right, we're going to start with the roll call. Jeremy Mask, present. Okay, you're not present. Melissa Keller, present. Roger, are you still there? Roger Kenoy, present. All right. And we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I have located the flag that's over here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. I'm going to review the I-35 mission statement and district priorities. Our mission statement reads, the Interstate 35 Community School District exists to develop lifelong learners and responsible, productive citizens uh, in an ever-changing society. Our district priorities. Number one, articulate and support a cohesive student-centered pre-K vision for continuous school improvement. Engage in effective teaching and relevant learning for the 21st century. And number three, operate with fiscal integrity, efficiency, and effectiveness. Um, all the board should have received the agenda and had time to review it. Uh, we do need a motion and a second to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda. And second that. It's been properly moved and seconded that we have approved the agenda. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 That puts us to the open forum. Residents, students, parents, guardians, and staff members of the district may address the board about relevant topics. Those who wish to speak must sign up at the beginning of the meeting. Speakers' participation is limited to five minutes per meeting. We ask speakers to remember that Iowa law prohibits the board from discussing for specific employees or students for their performance. Mr. Gibson? to stand in here. I guess I'll just stand right here in the corner. So thank you for your time. Um, I just wanted to bring up a couple more things regarding the transparency that the agenda was posted a little late but got access to it. Um, but none of the links work. I think I was only able to actually read uh, Mr. Bonte, Ms. Whitson, and Mr. Weber's uh, report. Um, all the other links um, were, were inaccessible. I requested access and didn't end up getting access to any of them. So I just want to bring that up again, we still got a transparency problem for the public documents. Parents and staff and students and others aren't able to read before a board meeting and have meaningful dialogue with their uh, district representatives. So I continue to ask that you work on that transparency side of it. In particular, one caught my attention, um, the district redistricting. So that link was accessible, but it's just a map and it's really hard to read. Um, best I could tell was there's like a little notch coming out of District 1 and it's moving over to District 2, um, but there's no, no data around what exactly the changes are, so I asked for a little bit more public uh, transparency um, on, on that redistricting and more around how that works and who makes that decision and everything, and preferably before the board meeting so we can have time to talk with board members with any concerns. So, um, the other thing I want to talk to you guys about is the Safer Families Act of 2023, House Study Bill 173. If you haven't looked at it, um, that's going to be fast-tracked pretty soon. A uh, bunch of parents and I had a part in Division 4 in particular um, of House Study Bill 173, which prohibits insurance companies from removing um, insurance coverages for schools that allow um, staff or um, uh, yeah, staff to, to carry and protect our kids. So um, I'd ask that you guys continue to pay attention to that. And I know that was one of your hangups before uh, of allowing trained staff to, to carry in our rural district where we got a 20 minute response time uh, from Madison County. Um, that's a long time. So please pay attention to that and be prepared to act quickly as soon as that 
uh, law gets signed in, uh, talk to Governor Reynolds, and they do plan on making that immediate upon signature, so it won't have to wait till July. So keep track of that, and if you guys can do work up ahead as much as possible for that so we don't have to wait, um, I'd be really appreciative of that. So those are the main things to talk about. Again, if we can continue to work on the transparency stuff so we can read stuff for a board meeting, like the bills and stuff, monthly bills, I couldn't get access to any of that stuff. So. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda is the third grade spotlight. Yes, we have third grade here with Ms. Okay. Um, I just want to tell you that in third grade, one of the standards that we work on is writing an opinion paper. And another standard that we work on is presenting a piece to an audience which is scary. And so we have four third graders, and we have some supporters. I need your support. Um, they are going to present an opinion, four opinion pieces. I get in the right order. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, yep. One of you over there, one of you over here. Their opinions, um, they were to write their opinion piece on whether our school should wear school uniforms or not. Unfortunately, I gave them what their opinion was. <laughs> the next one, they get to choose their own opinion. But, um, so they will be presenting, um, and they were a little nervous that you were gonna vote that we had to wear school uniforms. I assured them that was not the case. But, um, okay. My name is Wyatt. In my opinion, this is why we should wear school uniforms. One reason is that it will be easier to get dressed. Also, the morning will go quicker. Another reason why is that it's all laid out. This is why we should wear school uniforms. My name is Hayden Tuttle. If you ask me, I don't think we should wear school uniforms. One reason I feel this way is because Miss Lepkis would see that we are wearing the same thing and call us the wrong name. Another <laughs> reason is it would be boring to wear the same thing every day. And last but not least is when you go outside and it's muddy, if you fall, you will get the uniform dirty or ruined. That is why I don't think we should wear school uniforms. Hi, I'm Charlotte. If you, if you ask me, we should wear school uniforms at Interstate 35 Community School. One reason I feel this way is because we will match, which means we will all look similar. Also, we, we will all look very nice and nobody will be made fun of or bullied. That's why we should wear school uniforms. Okay, one. In my opinion, I don't think I-35 should wear school uniforms because some are uncomfortable. Also, you can't show pride for a team or play. Another reason is if a visitor comes, you could get made fun of. My last reason is because the uniforms might be a little expensive and someone might not be able to afford it. That's why I'm against school uniforms. Everybody was invited to come to support, um, and everyone did a really nice job, but I thought these four did a really exceptional job of writing the um, expectations for an opinion piece. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you guys came. This is great. Thank you for coming. It's, it's not so, it's nervous when you're first, right, presenting yeah. stuff in front of somebody, but then you notice it's not so bad. We're just normal people, right? It's not so bad. But it takes a lot of guts to do this, so I appreciate it. Yes. Yeah. 
And I'd like to thank your parents for bringing you yes. Just coming to a school board meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. to our administrative reports, and I'll just go down the line. Mr. Bonte is up first. Yeah, if you click on mine, there's a link in there that'll have FAST data. Um, I've got uh, two um, English teachers here to kind of talk about the FAST data. Um, I'll talk just really quickly about our targeting policy and our behavior data for um, this, this year and this semester. Um, as we kind of talked about, our targeting policy um, wasn't really in full effect first semester. We got kind of behind ourselves. And there were, I think, 98 students I put on here that had three or more tardies per semester. Um, this semester, we're down to 25. Um, and, and those that are consistently serving after school, we've got a good process. Uh, they know what's going on when they get there. They come, they put their phones down, and then they work through the time um, that they're there from about 320 to 345. So we've seen a really good increase in terms of a decrease in behavior, if that makes sense. Uh, so that's been good. Um, and then if we look at our panorama data for percentile of students showing positive behavior, and that's uh, dictated by major referrals that are written in the system, and panorama pulls that nightly, and we can kind of look at that. And so at the time that I pulled that data, 91% of our ninth grade was meeting expectation, 94% of 10th grade, 94% of 11th, and 100% of 12th graders were meeting that expectation. And so um, we're on the right track. Um, a lot of it, a lot of conversations first semester that, that got us to that point, but um, I think the kids are really receptive to those conversations um, and changing their behavior as they go. So um, now to the really cool thing, I have Mrs. Donahue and Mrs. Belden here to talk about our FAST data for um, English language arts and everything they've done there. So if you could scroll down a little bit, there should be a PowerPoint slide. It's yellow, that FAST test growth. If you could click on that, um, then they just have a couple slides they want to talk to you about. Kind of a tough not to follow on those third graders, though. <laughs> okay, so we thought we would include the benchmarks to show with the FAST data. This is what we expect. This is the ninth grade, 10th grade, and 11th grade. So this was their fall where they should have been, and this is the winter. This would be ones that we'd consider on the college pathway. These are ones that would be at some risk, and these are ones that would be at the high risk that they need extra assistance. So. We have, <clears throat> sorry, so the F is fall, W is the winter, so in the fall, 65% uh, of the ninth grade was proficient. When we took the winter, we increased it to 73%. So what we have here, this is your ones that are at the high risk. This would be some risk, that means they just need a little extra support. These are the ones that are proficient, these are the ones that are considered the college pathway for the ninth grade. Okay, 10th uh, grade, I had 64.7% of my students achieve positive growth in their FAST testing, and they had over 420 points that they cumulatively achieved on that. Uh, I had 62% proficient in the fall and 72% proficient in the winter, so it increased by 10%. And then I had almost 80% positive growth with the 11th grade, but over 400 points of positive growth. And then 57% were proficient in the fall and 63% were proficient in the winter. So a majority of our students 9 through 12 either made positive growth or were proficient. <laughs> the first numbers you gave, I think, for context, those are in 553 points. Yeah, yeah. And then, so I guess, 
could you help me understand what what's the goal or benchmark to get these kids to proficient? Because I, I think I'm, I'm 100 percent proficient, right? right. I, I just don't know if there's proficient, and then there's you know, are there different categories beyond that, or um, uh, just the college pathway would be the one. So it goes above, right? It goes above. It just keeps increasing. I think the top score is 600, which we haven't seen, but. Got it. So if they fall above this number but below this number, that would be your proficient or sorry, this number. Here would be some that need a little extra support in some of the comprehension skills for reading okay. and writing. Mostly okay. the fast is for the comprehension part. Okay, so this helps me. But then there are no numbers, they're just percentages on the next slide, right? So, right, right. Okay. So all of these students here, your forty four percent or your forty six percent here in the winter mm -hmm. would have met that these that criteria right here. Got it. Right. right. So they would have been in the is advanced. Right. Regular. So they're above that 500 yeah. proficient. Yeah. Yeah. So they're above. Okay. So we just don't have those. This is just tells yeah. you kind yeah. of where they're supposed to be. Okay. They actually yeah. put okay. together. These are the type of things that they're assessed on. It's reading literature, reading for information. We included a sample. What it would look like for a student. We just took the student's name off. Yeah. So it would be, it shows this person is just above that college pathway, and then it shows the skills that they've achieved and some that they just need to work on. Got it. Got it. And is the target to get everybody to like 80% proficient? Is it 90? Is it 100? Is it that would be as a whole class. Yeah. That's how yeah. many are proficient. So we want them all as above that level. Got it. Okay. So when they fall in that high risk, that's when they start receiving the extra support. Okay, good. That's what I was going to ask. Yep. They, what's the, the intervention? So we utilize this to figure out what yep. the interventions are. And like, yep. Okay. And we had AEA come in and do a training on fast testing, A math, and A reading um, for all of our four teachers to go over that about a month ago so that we can start utilizing this better when we're preparing for our lessons because we know that sometimes, like in a science class, a student might do not do as well as they might do in another class, but it might be because they don't read very well. And it, it's not that they don't do science well, it's that they, they don't read as well. And so if we can bring down the level to, to what they can read at, then it's then the context is more um, is, is right there for them to grasp. And we're able to differentiate more than they are, meet them at their level and bring them back up. Okay, do you have any questions? <laughs> Last time is that, I thought, is that how this works? Yeah, that's how this is supposed to work, is what I'm just doing. Give me a second, I think I do. Yeah. Well, while you're looking for those, I did want to add something else. Uh, I spoke with my fifth and sixth grade reading in ELA teachers today and they're so excited because they're nearing that quarter again where the students were to read five books and if they read five books at their level, independent level, then they would get to have a party. So currently we're at 75 students out of 107 who have met the goal. They're looking to have 80 students out of 107. So. We're thinking 27 students um, will not be participating in that party, but instead those students will be working towards the next quarter. So hopefully 100% of those students will make the goal by the end of the year. So that's amazing, and, and those ladies have worked really hard, and students have to perform at least 70% or better on the um, comprehension questions to be able to even consider the book as um, a learning experience. So. That's awesome, and I'm pretty proud of the work that students and staff have been doing there. Yep. Capturing kids. Yep. Um, have you used that before? We're just starting. Uh, in fact, my friend over there, Danielle, <laughs> she, uh, they used it at her old school, and we were looking for ways to try to um, ask more questions of students so that the behaviors stay in that classroom instead of having to just always come to the office, but ways, working through ways to develop social skills and accountability on mm -hmm. the parts of our students. So we are just in the initial phase of this process. That was my question. And I am pretty proud of our data too, if you looked at the data, that was pretty amazing. So Hard work from these teachers that I have over here. <laughs> 
So am I done? <laughs> Finished? Anybody got a question? <laughs> we can open it up to the audience question. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let me get I will say, uh, your daughter and a few others, they come in because they weren't getting to read in the classroom uh, after they ate their lunch. So I was in the room when Mrs. Uh, Coder was discussing who could come and practice reading if they wanted to. And she had to turn them down. I said, you come to my office. So every day, they, there's a few that come to my office. I was going to say, I think there's a group, isn't there? Yeah, there's like a group. They're a, chat, they're a chatty group, but they're good. Actually, yeah. I actually do have a question. Conferences. So yes. Oh, twice a year. No, I love yeah. it that they're student driven and then mm -hmm. opened up to the parents as well. Mm -hmm. So the first time they have conferences, it's more parents and teachers. Well, right? it was this year. We're we're just initiating okay. the student led for this okay. time. Around. So it'll be like that going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we're excited okay. about it too. It's been like quickly. Let's gather the information for them to share, and yeah. then they'll practice, and then hopefully our parents will come support yeah. them. So. Okay. Yep, I like that. And then yeah. cell phone stuff. Oh, how's that going? It's going very good. I, we've only had a few. I bet on our list we have maybe ten students that have made a poor choice in using their phone. Okay. But no, it's and the students are talking at the table and even in the hallway. It's more positive. Yeah. The teachers will tell you that too. Oh, no cell phones ever. <laughs> <laughs> so we probably well, had more fractures at work than ten. Years, yeah. So. No, it's been a win-win. And it is good because like two, I had two boys today. <clears throat> One had forgotten his cell phone and it was in his hoodie. And he's just the sweetest little seventh grade kid. He's not, a, he's not a, he won't tell you tales, right? And he came, oh, I forgot my cell phone and I went to PE this morning. And I put it in my PE locker and it's not locked. Can I go get it? You know, because he's so worried it would be there. But he didn't realize he'd have to PE that he forgot to leave it in the right place. Yeah. So I had, I had two of those today. And it was, they just were so responsible about it. No, it's been going well. That's good. Good to hear. Thank you. All right. Well, wasn't any questions? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I write that. I'm sorry. I didn't get mine on a fancy PowerPoint, but I'll try to um, write around here real quick. I've got a few different um, pieces, and I just printed it directly off the site this time because I didn't get it on a separate sheet, so make sure I'm handing you guys all the same thing. So our fast testing just finished, if you yeah. didn't figure that yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of really good things going on. So. Just yeah. yeah, that's just fine. Okay. I should have just printed one page there. So same concept as what those gals were just showing you. Light purple is desirable. Purple is great. Light pink, we've got a little bit of work to do to catch up that gray discrepancy and and more of that dark pink um, is, we've got some sort of a problem going on here that we need to address. Did I get it? Yeah, okay. Sorry, yeah. Um, so this first one you have, it's labeled CVMR reading. This is words per minute. This is fluency, um, and that's it. The kids get... Um, three one-minute passages, and it averages out that um, result, and um, this kind of shows you where we started the year with that. First grade only has one column because uh, in the fall they do not do words per minute. They do have a similar test called sentence reading, uh, but it's more like a picture book, whereas this time around first graders were handed, you know, a single passage on a page um, that's kind of not equivalent so um, our school-wide goal is made around this data um, in addition to early literacy which I'll show you in a minute so kindergarten and first grade have an early literacy score and preschool we we kind of made up a early foundational skill comparison to feed into our school-wide goal as well so this is one of those pieces I will show you next the other, the early reading, which is the alternative test that kindergartners and first graders take. So these are more reading foundational, and there's a couple subtests that make up their overall score. Sorry. 
So obviously you can see a lot of celebrations on this page. Um, which means if we are making adjustments at that early early grade levels, and you can see that we're, we're moving ground, um, if we can continue to build up those practices at that age, we have a lot less hills to climb when they're fourth graders and they've gotten what they need the entire you know educational experience. So a lot of work has gone into phonemic awareness and phonics and early foundational literacy skills and those that growth shows we're, we're getting there. Um, and kindergarten was just giddy with themselves because they did have the first green column on our school-wide scoreboard that's in our entry there. Um, there are a lot more yellows. That they, they made up these things like, you know, we got a lot of ketchup and a lot of mustard and we just need some pickles. So they got really excited about it. We hung up a pickle in our window and they were super proud about that. So um, this next one, I should have printed them all this way, but this one is early math. So again, just kindergarten and first grade. I did click the longitudinal button. So what you're seeing is last year would be the first three scores, and this year would be the last two scores. So you can see, you know, in kindergarten, that looks really promising. Like what's caused that um, jump there? A lot of factors. We did adopt um, a math curriculum into preschool, but they didn't even have that last year. So we got to kind of sit through what are the factors that are supporting kinder, kindergartners being more grade ready for these types of assessments. And then obviously first grade went down a little bit. Um, in the grand scheme of things, that's probably about two kids, two first graders making up that um, variation. Um, but that's, you know, something that our team can analyze and figure out how do we want to um, proceed and what do we need to do to make sure that that number goes up the next time. So that's a little bit of that. Any other questions about my report um, or anything else you want to talk about? Is there individual reporting that's still sent home for the student? Yep. Okay. Yep. So each, all of yep. Okay. each classroom teacher has the discretion to build their own um, or FAST does make a parent summary yep. that gives all of that. So yeah, either way they can. Yeah, so now, anything else? Well, just if you remember the process, because I think sometimes it's good to review, this is the screening test. So if a student flags on this, so they're in that pink zone, um, then our interventionist will work with that student and probably give them a diagnostic test to see if there's something in that either foundational skill makeup that we can target right away, mm -hmm. um, or look and see if there's something whole class and so some of those curricular issues. So this is just the screener, and it's actually supposed to flag more students uh, because it doesn't want anybody to fall through the cracks. So um, this is kind of a precursor. It's not the same information as what we see on ISAS and FAST. We don't do that for um, ISAS for um, our early kiddos anyway. But the foundational skills, as Danielle said, are kind of that, that base. And so um, if we're seeing these scores, the idea is that we'll see these continue to trend up um, in grades because they'll be fluent and they'll be able to comprehend. So when we had Ms. Feldman and um, Ms. Donahue here talking about comprehension, um, that's that's kind of how it all starts, is those foundational skills, but it's not this, it's just a screen. So just to clarify, because we've talked about screeners, we've talked about diagnostic, we've talked about summative, this is just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah, this is, you know, at, at the teaching standpoint, and my teams have done just wonderful, but you know, we saw this, we printed it off, we dug into it, and then they're, you know, 20 steps ahead already. So unfortunately, I didn't get to share it with you guys, but um, they've just been phenomenal at planning what that, what our intervention system looks like in our enrichment system, and just the fluidity of kids getting what they need uh, in our intervention system, which is referred to as when, just they're doing so great, and kids are loving it, and they're growing, so. It's been awesome. Anything else? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Weber.
Uh, last month, there was quite a few questions about special education, and so I, I centered all my data for this meeting on special ed, gave you an overview uh, of some different tools we're using at each level. Uh, one of the biggest ones is this goal aimline document. That actually came from Ms. Woods. It's a tool she used in her old building. When we started going over it a couple months ago, the elementary teachers, and then have progressed through middle school and into high school, but that document allows um, any administrator that's coming into an IP meeting that doesn't live and breathe um, the, I, the IEPs and know the data every single day could quickly look at a student, what goals they have, and where their current trajectory is, so they have an idea of, of where that's sitting and can ask the right type of questions with, with that team sitting there. So, um, last month we went over, you know, I've been putting on the, the number we're exiting, you know, I try to update that for every meeting, and so I went back a couple of years to the year before I got here and try to pull the data to give you just a really quick glimpse there on the bottom right hand side of how special ed numbers are increasing and with that keeping in mind that we have seniors that are obviously graduating every single year we have kids that are exiting you know we're at seven we'll actually be at eight in a couple of days that's the pending one we just have to get the meeting the parent in here um, and then hopefully a ninth one that will be exiting and we have students that move out um, you know every all those things are happening for the numbers to go down and yet the numbers are increasing at a higher pace. Um, and so that gives you that overview, um, I know a couple people had asked about last month, of where we're currently at as a district, um, and that's, that's all great levels. So taking, looking at that or any of the other stuff, is there any, any questions? And as a percent, that's more than 10% of the student so yeah, what isn't in there, I actually I put it in and then it started to not be a quick glimpse. <laughs> it's a rabbit hole. I mean, right. You can I really dig, dig into more. it. And I started getting way too deep as like the level zeros aren't in there. So level zero is a, is a student that just has speech. Okay? Our teachers aren't working SDI with those students. That's the AEA. You know, we have a speech that prepared this here. So, so if you actually look at those numbers, like we currently have 16 speech or 15. So it's 114 total currently today as we stand here. But 15 of those aren't, aren't students that we're looking at special ed teachers and associates and all of those to work with on a daily basis. So I, so I kind of eliminated those. Um, I also got to a point where those are really hard to find on all the different state sites. I went in and talked with Ted. The zero, because we're not, our funding doesn't staple to those, those students, it's hard to be accurate. So I decided to delete those off and give you just the true numbers of what we know. So, and these are kids that we're serving in our building. So they do not include, you know, we have students that we transport so we do get funding for it, but we're transporting to another district because we don't offer the service. Um, that's not in the numbers. These are actual ones that our teachers are working on. What, what services do we not offer? That just so, so like that specific one would be like um, a tier three, 100% um, student that needs a one-on-one -on -one teacher all day long. So that, that type of service. And we don't, we and do a not teacher have versus an associate. Correct. Okay, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we have students that, I mean, we have wheelchair bound students. We have mm -hmm. students that, that have a high number of SDI minutes, but a student that has, like in this case, 100% uh, one-on-one -on -one teacher to ratio and associate, like that service we don't currently have. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Superintendent reports. Yeah, so um, there are just two things that I wanted to talk about. Um, some background on some proposed bills um, that spent an active time at the State House. So um, that's always kind of interesting to see how that plays out. Um, there's one that is um, the Governor's um, Transparency and Parents' Rights Bill. Um, and this has a lot of provisions for what schools can and cannot do um, around things like um, giving surveys to students and um, you know when you can teach about sex education and all of those things that obviously a parent um, should be a part of the conversation and so it just limits some of that um, a lot of it's by grade level um, so you know you shouldn't be teaching sex ed to kids that are younger than third grade right I mean so those are some of the things that are in this um, transparency it's also got information in there about um, resources so books in the library our catalog is online so parents can see that already um, we did this year set up where if you are a parent and wanted to have um, notification I think we've got it kind of worked out that you get an email notification now so the librarian isn't necessarily calling everybody it's just an email 
and, and the parent can then send back, yep, the, these are okay for my student or no. Um, and then that, that's kind of the process for making sure parents are aware of um, what's happening in their students' reading selections. Um, so there's a lot of things in that. It's a, it, I think they built on what they had last year. We've talked about this in the past. So um, I think the idea with this is, is with everything that we're seeing in, in kind of this, um, this avenue of, of legislation is just making sure parents are informed, that they have an idea of what's happening in the school, that they have knowledge, um, because then they can make good decisions about what's best for their kid. Um, and so that's kind of the, the parents' rights um, and transparency. There's another one that's also going through that is um, more of a comprehensive look at Chapter 12, which is the, um, the kind of governing document, the code that dictates um, what schools can and cannot do. And so that one is, uh, I would call it almost a deregulation type of a bill, where they're looking at some of the things that have been imposed on schools over the past several years and saying, why are we doing this? And, and taking some of that off the off the table. So those are two, uh, they're, they're both very big. <laughs> um, there's a lot of provisions in each one, um, but they're definitely worth looking at and, and maybe having a conversation about either with um, a legislator or um, you know, even a neighbor, just so that people are informed. Um, I think there's a lot of merit in both of them. Um, the other one, and I, and I apologize, I didn't say, I told you too, but there's actually a third one on preschool funding. This is one of the things that we talk about with our rural school advocates um, advocacy. So when, when I go to the meeting in October, this is one that's always come up. And um, what they're doing is they're proposing that um, if you are 200% below the poverty level, then your whole day would be funded. And that's a change because right now it's only a 0.5 funding and so the idea is if if the student is here all day and the parent is 200 percent below um, income on the poverty level then that would be a full funding weight so we would get a 1.0 instead of a 0.5 which would really help um, kids who need that early start to school so if you're talking to your legislators that's one i think really would would benefit a lot of kids and it should probably be something that that we're at least um, making ourselves aware of because that does really impact us um, as a rural school. So I, I can go through some of the highlights of these, but there are so many things that I'm just guess I'm going to encourage you to, to look at them both um, and maybe contact your, your representatives if you feel the need to. But um, the transparency for parents, I think, is a comprehensive look at how parents are involved in education and the, the kind of uh, House Study 119 on um, how Chapter 12 is kind of outlined in, in schools. Those are both really, I think, meaty bills that um, that need to be looked at and, and maybe talked about if, if you are so inclined. So, has uh, has Margaret put out Mrs. Buckton put out anything on? On, on they, you know, they do a they do a weekly um, webinar, and then they do a, a summary, and I can forward that for both of those. Okay. And I and I can do the preschool as well. I don't I don't I didn't know you guys weren't getting them, but I can even put those just on our website um, if we want to, just so that even public can see them if they want to see what those bills are about. Okay. <clears throat> Did you have anything else for us? No. Nope. All right. Are there any other questions? All right. We'll move on to the next item. Discuss and approve consent items. These do require a motion and a second for us to take action. Um, the past meeting minutes, everybody should have uh, had an opportunity to look at and review. Our monthly bills and the financial statement have been distributed with uh, a couple items on the desk tonight open enrollment, and then resignation and con contract. Um, Nathan McKinney hired as track throwing coach, Whitney Hutton hired as an associate, and Zadie Hatfield resigned as a long-term substitute. Does yours say John Adams? I've been informed that was no longer something. Oh, okay. Thank you.
So because that was on the agenda that was published, you probably need to okay. say that that's okay. off the yeah, agenda. Yeah, there was an item on there for yeah. uh, Mr. John Adams, um, and that is no longer under consideration. You got a motion, I'd, I'd entertain it. <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve the consent item. So we properly moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda items. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, items for discussion. Third reading of the 100 and 600 series board policy. This does require a motion and a second for us to take action on. And this is our third and final reading of this policy. We read, we read through the, did we not read through the policy? On the, the first, first one. On the first mm -hmm. one? Yeah. And there's been no changes since then? No. I'll make a motion to approve the third reading of 100 and 600 series board policy. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded to approve the third reading of the 100 and 600 series board policy. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? Board approval to issue project for bid air conditioning. So this is um, the, our second attempt at getting air conditioning in our uh, middle school wing and our high school wing. Um, if you remember, we did have this as part of our ESSER funding projection about a year and a half ago when the bids came back um, almost double what the projection was. So we tabled it or, or didn't accept any of the bids um, for cost. And so what we did this time is we broke the bid into two different parts. Um, we did ask that, where we're asking that the contractors bid all the equipment at one time. So hopefully if we buy in bulk, we can um, get a lower cost and then depending on when installation happens, we would have the units here and then just install as we were able to. So um, this is the, um, the proposal for us to, to move forward with that process. Um, right now we're slated to do the um, public flooding of bids on Friday, March 3rd, so this Friday. Unless the board decides not to. So. This is just a bid, so there's Correct. no harm in it. You Correct. Know, I mean, right. We're going to put it out there and see what the bids are. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Right. And is this not the gym? This is not the gym. Okay. That'll be coming up later. Yes. Okay. All right. This does require a motion and a second for us to <laughs> approve the issue project for bid. Move to approve the issue project for bid for air conditioning as presented. I will second that. All right, it's been properly moved and seconded to uh, approve the issue project for bid. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? All right, next item is the district redistricting. So, um, yeah, with the, with the census of 2020, um, the idea is, is that all school districts in the state of Iowa are looking to see if their population shifted in the districts for the schools. So you may have seen this. I think um, Dallas Center Graggs is trying to go to all at-large districts, so it's the time to kind of shift where your districts are um, according to population. And so currently, um, we have uh, a variation of three people um, from 
the census, but that does mean that we're outside of the 10%, and so the recommendation is, is that we do um, shift our boundaries accordingly. So we've been working with Cornerstone um, Geospatial Consulting, and um, so the proposal is the map that Mr. Nixon alluded to earlier. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up. And so the, the area that's really impacted is just right here um, in St. Charles. Um, there's, a, there's a section where it moved to accommodate the population. None of the other district boundaries have moved. Um, and so the idea is, is that we get within that 10% and you can kind of see over on the left hand side um, what those um, proposed district populations would be. So um, this is for your information. We'll bring it back in um, March for you to either approve of it or if you have suggestions or questions before then, um, you can let us know and we can bring back additional information in March. So just wanted you to have this and kind of understand why we're moving a boundary for three people, but that gets us within kind of the, the idea of what the, the structure is built for. So this is just to allow uh, people to run in this. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we got you right here. Um, can you provide a marked up map that shows us the change? Maybe you're showing it to them, but yeah. that's something you can uh, provide us before next month? Well, you bet. Ted and I had to really look for it. Yeah. Um, it literally is just one of the lines right here, but we will get that for you. And if the board doesn't do anything, then the state will do it for us. Because right. it's required that we get within the requirement. Yeah. If the state does it, will it will look like what you have here? Or what it might or it might not, but I would anticipate it would be close to somewhere in that St. Charles district okay. for the population. Because we could shift it north, or I mean, right, wouldn't right, okay, right, yeah. You can take those three people anywhere, yeah, as long as they move out of, I think, out of one and into two, or out of two and into one. And this is just everybody gets to vote for everybody. It's just for people who are running. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So our four, yeah, our four director districts um, have to live in that district. So um, if you're representing District 3, you have to live in District 3. Um, we have, you have one at-large, that's why we have five, and that at-large can live anywhere in the district. I believe this happened in 1992, where we had to be district again, <laughs> according to our files. Well, after the census. Right. Yeah. So it's happened before. <laughs> and what's the benefits of going all at-large? Like, would that, that wouldn't, that would seem not to be fair then, right? Or would it be fair? Yeah, I think, you know, so when we look at Dallas and our grinds, yeah. because of the Why population of those two towns, oh. they were a little worried about Dallas Center not having as much representation as Grimes would because the population is so much larger in Grimes. So they thought even if they were all at large, they wouldn't have a fair representation. Um, I, when I think of us in this district mapping, we're such a big district that it's really hard to, I mean, I think it's hard for people way over in eastern, more in county number three to know everybody that's way over you know what I mean just on a personal level to know if they can if they'll represent them if they'll you know like they feel like they're a neighbor kind of thing so I think that there was you know I, I, Dallas Thunder Grimes is the only school I heard that was talking about going to the all at large but and I think they had I don't know if they're even following through with that now based on the feedback from the community but So I, this is again, for your information, um, we can take action in um, March or in April. Well, we have to have it kind of decided by May. So if you want our, um, our lady that we're working with to come up with different options, we can definitely do that too. We just have to, to pull them for that balance. But I will send a markup and make that available in the district office if anybody wants to come see it. I mean, I can even put it online. I'm just not, Heather will help me figure out how to make that mark on the map so that it can be seen. Drop a pin. <laughs> What's that? Drop a pin. Yeah, that's, that's about what it is. Yeah. All right. Any other questions Any about other that? Any questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Set up an agreement with the support staff. This does require a motion and second plus take action. 
Yeah, so we had a great meeting. We had one meeting with our support staff and um, agreed on a 3.337% increase um, for all of our support staff and um, just a real, real positive experience. So I recommend that you accept the 3.337% increase. Any questions on the negotiated agreement? No? I'd entertain a motion and a second. Mm -hmm. Let's take action. I'll make a motion to approve the settlement agreement with the support staff as presented. So properly moved and seconded to approve the settlement agreement with the support staff as presented. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? And we'll move on to the UTV bid. This also requires a motion and a second for us to take action. So this is a replacement of our current um, utility vehicle. Uh, Mr. Bedwell is recommending that we use the Kubota for a sundown equipment bid that's in the packet. And Mr. Bauer, ever diligent, has recognized that it's not exactly right on the math, so it's actually twenty thousand five hundred dollars is the bid. Um, so we do have the other bids that were in here. I think we had a couple from John Deere, um, and I can't remember where else. There's one other one. But Mr. Bedwell has used the Kubota. That's what we currently have. Uh, they're willing to give us the most trade-in, and they um, are also very attentive to um, to customer service and servicing. Um, Manual. I'm sorry, that's the other one. I knew there was another one, and it was the lowest bid. So, what is the issue with the current UTV? Age. Just age. <laughs> but it still retains that kind of value. Yes. I don't, I don't suppose, I, I'm not even going to pretend to think I know why they value some things at an amount, but that's what they told us. Okay. I think there's a hole in the floor of it. It's pretty old. Yeah. It's, Let me tell you. It's, 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 it's seen its And Don, Don's, Don's, Don has yeah. nursed it back to life quite a few times. Yeah. <laughs> so to finally get something out of it, I think, is the goal, because it, it is, yeah. it's on its death. And this is just one of those things that every, you know, six or seven years we're going to have to replace like we do our mowers and yep. so. Especially if you're using it for salt, it just eats away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'd move to accept the Kubota and the UTV bid as presented. I move to second that. To properly move and seconded to accept the quota as presented on the UTV bid. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. All right, we'll move on to the long range facility plan. This is for information only. So, this is uh, many months in the making. Um, I do have some information. The packet that you have has been in the board packet before, but I we've added a few things, but they're only preliminary. So this will all be made available um, on our website um, for public to review before our next meeting. But I want to go through what it is so that there's if there are questions, people can, can contact us, um, either Mr. Weber or myself, and we can go through any questions that people have. Um, the first part of the packet is all the information we've seen in the past about what the scope of this project is. If you remember, we've been working with students and teachers and coaches and community members to, to think long term, to think you know, the next 10, 15, 20 years for our facilities and how we're using those and what kind of, of life we need to get out of them. And so um, the group has met several times and we've uh, kind of narrowed down our focus um, into to different areas. We did have a facilities meeting about a month ago, three weeks ago, and the facilities committee made recommendations about, um, based on funding, what projects we would like to, to start to kind of work toward. 
So if you go, the first part is all just a, a reminder. I didn't know if you guys would have it with you, so I wanted you to have that. But there should be a yellow sheet in your packet. So if you go to the, the page after that, you get the preliminary draft, which is what's on the overhead. And so uh, we met with Matt Gillespie from um, Piper Sandler, who is um, kind of our bonding expert. Um, he's planning on being here next month to do a work session with us over this in a lot more detail. Um, but he trusted me to go over some preliminary information with you um, now. So the, the, the page that looks like this, and I'm not going to put it up there because this is a blown up version. Um, so this is right after the preliminary draft. Where you see a check mark on this page is where we can allocate funds according to, to his recommendations. And so if you look, um, in the summer of 2023, this summer, we could allocate $6 million or $6.5 million towards the project. Um, next summer, we could allocate $4.47 million. In the summer of 2027, we could allocate $16.6 .6 million. Now, let me back that up a little bit. We can allocate that with public approval. <laughs> right? This isn't just the board deciding we're going to do this. So all of these would go before the, the um, public um, and have hearings and have a lot more information about what it all entailed, what the money would break down into. But this is just the funding that would be available. We would have the potential to borrow this or to bond for this. Capacity. The capacity, correct. And then the last one is the summer of 2032. Um, there's a $10 million mark there. I don't know if you can read that very clearly. So those are the those are kind of the, the um, years when we could bond or um, allocate money for these facilities projects. So if you look, one of the suggestions from the committee was we create a draft of what we would do um, and where those funding sources would come from. So to explain this, because I wanted you guys to have plenty of time to look at it before our work session next month, um, what we're calling phase one is a combination of several different projects. So it would be a new baseball and softball field to the north of where our CTE building is. And it would also be, um, the very bottom item there is a, what we're calling a field house. It would be the restrooms and the concession stands. So baseball and softball would move to the north once that's done, and then the concessions and the restrooms would be right there. So that would be phase one. Um, this, if you read it, the numbers are based on today's dollars. We know that there's going to be inflation. We know that there's going to be um, different costs. So we had to have a constant, though, to give you an idea. So if we put all of those in phase one, um, it would cost us about $5.5 million. Okay. Right now, we have about $6.5 million that we could use. So that leaves us about $927 thousand dollars that we would roll over into the next project um, the next project is a little trickier because we don't know the actual cost and we also don't know um, what kind of funding we can get to help support this ideally we would like to do the daycare in phase two so next summer um, but we were we we broke it into two parts we would have um, phase one of the daycare and then phase two of the daycare depending on funding, but phase one would be the academic piece of that, so the classrooms um, and the office, but depending on what the cost projections come in, that would shift. So this is the, the total cost for that project right now is about $4.8 million, and we had allocated about 500, looks like 500, uh, let me put my glasses on so I'm not telling you something that's not true. Um, it looks like we would need about $332,000 to make that work. Now, when we had um, OPN bid this, they, they thought worst case scenario. So we don't know how close or how far those numbers are going to be. So if we can't do the daycare in the summer of 2024 based on funding, then we would move to phase three, this yellow section, which is um, could possibly be part two of the field building, 
um, updating our science lab and our both chemistry and biology, and then doing the gym, the air conditioning for the gym, the multi-purpose room, getting ventilation in that wrestling room, and doing some of those upgrades to the locker rooms um, that we know need to, need to happen. So ideally, we'd like to do the daycare, um, or at least project to do the daycare in the summer of 2024. Um, as we've talked about this last year, there was a $1.5 million matching grant that we could have applied for. So if we already know we have this money allocated for that project and that opens again, then we have the possibility of an additional $1.5 million for the daycare. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't take that off the table because we know that's a high need, but we also are realistic. When we do it, we want to do it right. And so um, that one is, is still up in the air, but at least gives you an idea of what that looks like. The big one is the summer of 2027, and that would be um, the athletic complex which would be um, track, soccer, um, new stadium, and, uh, I'm sorry, not soccer, track and football, <laughs> ideally soccer, right, from a former soccer player. Yeah, <laughs> um, but uh, obviously lighting and, and everything that goes with the new stadium would be included in that, bleachers. It does have um, us fitting up, finishing off a road around the back side of the campus, so taking this road all the way around and out on the east side of the, of the campus. Um, it does have two parking lots, um, and a cross-country loop is included in that. So that would be in phase three. And then depending on funding, um, those other items would be added as well. So that leaves kind of our, our, our little hodgepodge of things that we have not allocated yet. Um, for that 2032, and that could be um, the second part of the daycare center, which if you remember was uh, a gym and um, a, a community center for um, community to use, possibly senior citizen center. Um, it would include, it could include that field building. If that, the second part of the field building, so we do concession stand and locker or restrooms in phase one, the second part of that is team rooms and storage and locker rooms, locker officials rooms, rooms. Yep. officials rooms for any of the sports that are happening on that north part of the complex. We did talk about um, creating an at-risk space and also what a west parking lot right now it's gravel, um, but if we wanted to pave that at some point, that's in that kind of fourth phase in 2032. So um, if you look to the to the very far right column, that kind of tells you where that funding stream would come from, and so Matt will be here next next month to talk us through all of that in more detail. This does assume that the public votes to continue, not to raise, but to continue our PEPL funds um, for two 10-year periods, um, and, and if that doesn't happen, then obviously this shifts. Um, and it also, um, it assumes that a GEO bond would be in place um, that kind of just takes the place of the loan that we currently have. So all of those things the public would have to agree to, and as we're just in the beginning stages of this, we wanted to get information out to people sooner rather than later so that they could see kind of how it all looks kind of, you know, towards the end. But as far as the timeline, we've talked about, um, you know, the facilities committee wants to go now, <laughs> um, which is fine, but we also want to make sure we're, um, we're, attuned to what we're spending money on and what we're asking taxpayers for so um, we're we're just working through the process of what that looks like so before i ask questions i want to get to the couple of things that i have on the agenda um, the funding stream that possible pathways is the sheet that um, matt gillespie provided in the packet i would like to have the board consider retaining OPN Architect Services um, and, and possibly approve that for next month. Uh, they are the ones who have been working with us on this whole process. Um, we met with them, uh, Mr. Webb and I met with them last week um, and talked to them about some of the um, new, new ways of hiring um, construction managers or general contractors and what their experiences have been. Um, also thinking about 
we want this to be a facility that's viable in 30 years, so what kinds of things are they thinking about now to make that an option? Um, I don't want it to be that in 10 years we're dealing with a drainage issue or you know some of those um, considerations. So what kinds of materials are we going to be using to make this something that's going to be not only that our community has pride in, but also something that can sustain time. So we had a really good conversation with them, and they are willing to be here. I think they said they'd come in March as well if, if we wanted them to. Um, to talk a little bit more about those things. Um, so next, we're going to talk about securing funding for Phase 1, and then I gave you a preview of what Phase 2, Phase 3, Phase 4 could look like. But this is, this is kind of in, in motion as we go. But we, we had a long list of things that people wanted, and so we're trying to figure out how to make that work and, and still be fiscally responsible. So. Any questions on that? So would we sign a new, another contract with OPN? Yes. Okay. Yes. So what we paid them on these bills, is that for the current existing contract? Was that last? That was for all the work to create our, our long-range plan. Got so it. this work to get us all the numbers, the projections, to give us a, 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 an inkling of what a design could look like. Uh -huh. um, you know, like if we look at daycare, and let's say that they can design something that meets our needs and it's not $3 million, then if we know that we still want all those things and maybe the next phase, then they can help us, they would design that. And so they've been with us since the beginning of these conversations. So um, they're very open to that and um, have been very receptive. So yes, they, it would be a new contract and that's part of the cost that's in here in your sheet. If you look at, um, This part right here, where there's like an initial cost, that 28% is a lot of those extra services. So it's putting in um, things like architect services, contingency, um, the builders, what do they call that? Do you have it right there? Let's go. I can leave it up too. Your contractors, contingency escalations, yeah. construction costs, subtotals, soft costs, everything involved. Yeah, so that's all in that kind of bottom right hand, right here on the document, mm -hmm. because it changes from year to year. Yeah, and so, um, and, and so when I when I show you this, know that this these numbers will change, and you will have all that information of what we're going to ask you to approve when we have set numbers. This is just based on all the ideas that people came up with. This is what this is what they projected. So. So this shows preliminary that the gym air conditioning would be summer of 2027? Correct. And that would be new bleachers, and that's about a 1.3... So that the gym includes new bleachers yes. plus air conditioning? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. And there is a breakdown. I think you guys have it in the packet I gave you of what it, what it all includes. So I didn't, but oh, yeah, again, it's not it's not 100% defined yet. So that's why we need to get OPN kind of on board so we can start getting some real <laughs> plans drawn so we can do these. But um, it gives you a general idea mm -hmm. of what the scope of each of those projects is. And this packet will be available in the office tomorrow. Correct. So I think this is the numbers. What do you, what, 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 what are the next steps? Like, do, you, do we think about or do we put it on the air to approve phase one after we get the numbers done, contingent right. upon the public's approval, or how do we, how do right. we get that out of the office and into the people's right. hands, I guess? Right, yeah. so we're going to have the work session with Matt. Yeah. And once we have him here, because he's going to be our bond expert, Ooh, and so yeah. he's going to tell us next steps, just like ISG did for our air conditioning. Yeah. They told us the notice of letting needs to be out by March 3rd in order, I mean, that's why we pay these yeah. companies to do that. Um, so they're going to talk, he's going to work with us on their next steps, and that's why if we can get Joe Wallace there, or Rick, or whomever from OPN, then we can have an, an actual actionable task after our next meeting. I just, this is such a big topic that I wanted everybody to have it well in advance and have mm -hmm. conversations. So um, if there's something that, that needs to be talked about with board members or, or you know, with me or with Mr. Weber, 
we can we can address those if there's um, something that we want to talk about before our next meeting. But the next meeting to me is kind of our timeline and our action meeting. Right, because if this is this would be summer of 2023. So yeah, and the nice thing about that first phase is it's the baseball and softball, so we can still play over here even that if it's works. not done right away. Yeah, and so that's you know the advantage is it's not a space that we have to turn around within a season. Any other questions? Security update. Additional exterior video door cameras and remote access does, does require a motion a second for us to watch. So, um, based on um, feedback from our um, audits, we have two locations in the building that um, we have what we would consider not tight control of as far as where or who has um, the FOB to get in. Uh, past practice has been that we issue about 10 students FOBs that come from the CTE building into this building and that's just, we've got kids standing out there sometimes, we've got the door propped open sometimes. So what we're, what we're proposing is, is that we put a system in at both this exterior door, which is our main entrance from CTE, and the exterior entrance from the middle school on the other side of the street and it'll be a camera just like the front entrances it'll go to the secretaries at the front of the school they'll have to buzz the students in um, even between classes so then we won't have any of the fobs out it'll be strictly accessible if they're given access by the secretary so this bid is for those two locations how much more buzzing in that give them it's every period so when we have kids coming from so like multiple times or do they usually all they come usually come in a herd okay okay yep teenagers travel in a pack because <laughs> <laughs> yeah six extra times buzzing your kids yeah. in they the actually preferred that because then they could see who's coming in the building okay. i mean that so the same so our both of our secretaries currently sit on our safety team mm -hmm. and that was one of their recommendations And the middle school would go up to Susan? Correct. Okay. That's my understanding, is that true? We can we can set we can set to wherever. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this system integrates with our current system Correct. And capabilities. It's not just patchwork. It's good. Okay. Yeah, we're learning that the hard way with our fire panel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, not are, are we like up to date with fire drills? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we really don't have that. We have enough for next year already. <laughs> this does require a motion and a second for us to take action. I'll make a motion to approve the security update, video door cameras, and remote access. I'll second the motion. It's been properly moved and seconded to approve the additional exterior video door cameras and remote access. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Nay. All right. Softball field upgrades. It may sound funny because I know we just talked about getting a new softball baseball field, but this is to get us just a level playing field. So, um, I, we even reached out to, uh, to Coach Boggs, the old coach before our current coach, trying to figure out when was the last time that our softball field was remotely level. Um, for those that know that area, it is a low laying area compared to the baseball field anyways. So any major storm, we're going to be underwater and canceled. That's fine. The problem is, is the last two summers I've been here, we're canceling a number of games or moving our home date to, an, to a way to, to go accommodate for sprinkling because of the amount of puddles and if you saw us out there the last two summers we had crews out there with we were actually tarping our softball field last summer because we were trying to make sure we could get the regional games in because we were the host and so um, I had started last I think it was April calling companies to try and figure out who could do this outside of the one that all the ADs in our conference told me about 
and I continued to only come up with one company that could come out and do everything from bringing the dirt in from Minnesota, which is the softball dirt that gets used, to laser leveling and then getting all our pins in for the new bases and everything and getting it to where it's just a level surface that will drain somewhat normally. Um, and, and this is what we came up with. So it's just over 8,000. Um, the nice part is, since there's no current plans as we move forward with baseball and softball new, to just immediately uh, get rid of our old fields. I mean, we, we've talked about in the long scope of things, maybe having some more green space out that way and stuff, but nothing in the plans right now. It would allow us additional practice facilities. It would allow me middle school and high school to practice at the same time, which currently can't happen. And we're starting up our own home tournaments this summer with softball um, on Saturdays, which we haven't had in years. And would be the minute we have an extra playing surface that can withstand everything outside of a major storm would open up more than three teams. We could bring six to eight teams in here and have two fields and have an actual tournament. So um, I don't it's, I don't look at it as 8,000 that in a year will never get used again. I think it's going to be used for a while. Um, just want to get it to where it's a little bit more of a normal playing surface. So that's so, where I'm at. Uh, Mr. Weber, it says that the uh, pricing is the 30 days unless otherwise noted. He, he is, we, 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 we reached out twice to each other and he knew he was waiting on this board meeting. So he said as long as it came back this week, I was fine. Okay. Yep. And that would be good for unless this? Unless it goes down. What's that? Okay. Unless it goes down. Well, yep. <laughs> <laughs> but that's for, the, for even playing this summer. This this would be done this spring, yeah. yeah. He would have. Yeah. You'll see these two bids, this one and the next thing. I've been working on for about a year, so you may see that. But we've been in constant communication. You so. talked about tarping and whatnot, but is there a safety concern with what we currently have as well? Yeah. yeah. Just because of the, the there's, I, I have pictures I can show you. Even with a little bit of rain, the amount of divots we have out there, um, even as we brought in our own dirt to try and make it level, it just isn't the right stuff. Moving forward, are there any plans for the outfield? I heard the outfield is pretty bad. Also, what we're the softball field. That that's one of the biggest reasons we didn't pick that site to try and rebuild them. Um, the costs involved on I mean those that have been around here longer than me know that a building used to be there and there's quite a bit of that building still rubbled down in there. Um, the cost of trying to dig all of that up is preventative to me. So I, I don't think because of what it would be used for in the future, assuming we move forward with everything else, um, I think it would still suffice for what we do. I think Eddie would remember that uh, when we talked about the auditorium, bus shed, things like that, the cost of dirt work was astronomical mm -hmm. for any part of the project. So. Yeah. You'll notice that a large part of that bid is just hauling all those 50 tons or whatever of dirt down here. So. Are there any other questions? Not hearing any, I would entertain a motion and a second to take action. I move to approve the softball field up, please. And I'll move to second. It's been properly moved and seconded to approve the softball field upgrades as presented. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? to the field irrigation bid. So this one, a little different than the softball one, is a long-term plan. So currently, for those that are unaware, um, the way that we keep that field alive and working to where it's somewhat green in the fall is a single water spreader with about 600 feet of hosing, and every two hours all summer long it gets moved and it, it keeps itself on a rotation, but it takes a person going out there every two hours and moving it. When, when Don isn't here, if he's on vacation, if he's at the fair, or whatever they all go on, it's Rick or I all last summer that goes out and does that just to attempt to keep it to where it doesn't die off, which last summer was not easy. So um, last summer, just before last summer, I started calling around. I actually hassled four different companies every single month until I could get someone to come down and give me a bid. This is the one we could get, uh, and I listed those four companies in this debt linger, I know, so we can always get them too if they're not there. Um, but this would allow us to have proper irrigation out on that football field and around it. Um, it would also mean that uh, long term that field is not getting changed. So even if the track gets removed because of a daycare going in, the plan is that, that field is still going to be there for either a practice field, a soccer field, whatever have you. We're keeping that field. 
Um, and when that's done, we actually are going to have more fields that we're mowing and keeping track of. So the manpower of going out and keeping it watered by themselves all summer long, that it seems very silly. Um, so this, this would be long term. This is something that we'll continue to use as all the new state, uh, all the new fields and all that move forward in years to come. This field isn't going to change, so it's just something that's kind of overdue. So I'm assuming it has like a timer and... Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. Now, different than the, uh, than the softball, there's no drainage issue on the football field. Those that have been on it, that have ever striped it, uh, has a good crown on it. So it's, we, don't, we don't worry about that. Um, but, but it's, yeah, it, it is just, uh, it's, it's a lot of hours that we spend right now hand watering it. So. And I think the other thing that's good to note about this is that it can be expanded. Yep. So if the purpose of that field changes, we do have the ability Extra to... Extra zones. Yeah, so thinking, again, futuristic, right? We can create new zones. The other piece is also yes. that because things can look different, so when you start looking at our plans, um, if we start, let's say we break ground on something for baseball and softball as we get into the fall, that really limits our current football practice field. Now, I've already talked to Coach Stewart, and we know we can go to the baseball outfield, which is the old football field. We can move, utilize that space. We could also, though, practice multiple times a week on this space if it was water, if it could be watered properly. Um, right now, we don't ever touch it for practice because it would rip it up. There's just not, it doesn't, you can't hold the water. We don't have enough out here. Are there any other questions or conversation regarding the field of irrigation? Here? Not hearing any, I would entertain any motion to take action on the field of irrigation. Bill. I'll make a motion to approve the field of irrigation bid. Second. We we'll probably moved and seconded to approve the field irrigation bid as presented. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Opposed? All right. <laughs> Early retirement. This is also an actionable item. It requires a motion and a second for us to take action. So I originally brought um, early retirement to the board to consider, I think, way back in October. Um, and the intent was to try and um, um, give enough notice to our eligible retirees to make a decision, have a chance to visit with um, their financial advisors, IPERS, all those agencies, and um, hopefully we would be able to make decisions best for the district in, the, in the, what we call like the first hiring season. Um, at the time, the, the board approved a 60-year um, 60 years of age and 20 years of service, and um, we had one teacher eligible. Um, I am asking for the board to consider reducing that to 58 years old and 17 years of service in the district, and this is truly for management purposes. Um, when we look at, um, you know, 3% new money, and we look at um, some of the challenges of being down eight students, um, we know that we're going to have to make budget reductions, budget cuts, and so if we can do that through um, attrition and also recognize our retirees for their service here, I think it's a win-win. So um, I'm asking that um, the board approve uh, an early retirement option. This would go to all eligible employees by Wednesday of this week. We'd ask that they come back um, by Tuesday, March 14th. And then um, they would be on the March 27th board for approval. Um, once these are brought to the district office, their positions would be posted as anticipated. So if I get somebody who comes in tomorrow and, or Wednesday and says, yep, sign me up, um, I will post that position as anticipated um, so that we can, again, try and get in that early hiring season or as early as we possibly can. So um, the, the, the retiree has seven days to withdraw their um, retirement, and that's all spelled out in the package for the retirees. Um, but the new numbers, 58 years old and 17 years of service in the district, would make five teachers eligible. I 
and they would all be aware that their positions would be posted. I will make them aware that that's one of the, and it just as anticipated. Yeah. So we can always take those down and. Now, so this is the thing you attached that shows eight teachers, and it looks like six would still be available. Maybe I'm wrong. 58. Uh, one, one, two. One, two, three, two, four, five, four, five. So there's four. Okay. All right. So, I can't, I can't, yeah, Sarah, can you tell us, you know, weighing this being a management thing, understanding uh, you know, the cost reduction strategy versus being able to fill these positions, um, you are probably aware of who the five are. Are those hard to fill positions? What's the what's our risk here? What's our risk here of not being able to fill these positions for next year? That's a loaded question, Roger. But yes, all of them are hard to fill. If you ask me, when you have that many years of experience in the classroom, um, to get that back is very hard to do. As far as the the position and which teaching spot it is. Every position in education right now is what I would deem hard to fill. Um, I think that the administrative team has talked through scenarios about um, if, if X person decides to take retirement, what can we do? And so um, I think we have a pretty solid plan for how we could still have really high quality instruction and shift the, the people that we currently have um, to meet some of those needs. We would still have to post um, a position or two, but that's that's the intent is to reduce that and, and move some of the people we have so that they can still be um, employed. And um, so, yeah, I yes, they, they are hard to fill, I, but we also have a plan that I think will put us in a good spot to be to be in a in a in a good place for next school year. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I think I think enough it does. Okay. Um, I guess my follow-up question to that is um, management fund-wise, we're that's where this gets funded from, from if I remember correctly. Right. Correct. Um, we're in good we're in good shape there for if all five did choose to accept this. Correct. As you can see on the sheet we handed out. Your balance is 429000 plus we should get 180000 yet in tax revenue. And so that just as a reminder, it's 30000 and an HRA for the retirees. So it would be 150000 if all five of them took it. And our balance is over four hundred twenty now with another 180000 And what is, the, what is the cost of a new teacher? Or, I'm sorry, what are you paying a new teacher? Um, total package is about fifty. Forty thousand, just for base. Well, for yeah. yeah, just so I can have a. But then, so like and I'm benefits. At salary for active employees only based yeah. contract of right? Yeah, so it's about yeah, I would say it's probably about fifty fifty one. For the base. But no, with insurance. With insurance. Yeah, with insurance. yeah so base I, is just forty. I'm sorry, 40. forty. Yes. And so you'll be saving ten ten thousand at least. You know, and yes. so you've got a payback on your on your investment of two Correct. or three years, is what. It's, Correct. Yeah, that's all I was trying to get. Yes. So that yes, seems I'm like sorry. a reasonable. Yes. Payback. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions? Not hearing any. Does anybody have a motion? To take action on this? I move to propose opening the early retirement option for staff with the following criteria 58 years old and 17 years of service in the district, which is the amendment as presented. But just want to put it in. I'll second. I'll second that. All right. Roger. <laughs> It's been properly moved and seconded that we approve the early retirement um, as presented. All those in favor, signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Sorry, Roger. Gotcha. Opposed? 
All right. And that brings us to our closed session to review the school safety plan. Um, uh, break. Yes, let's go ahead and take a quick break as well. So.